We're just trying to change the world here, people. Oh, really? It's time for another good idea, bad idea. Good idea. Welcome back to Early Radio 133. This is uh, recorded, uh, yeah, it's still just barely Friday, November 18th, 2016, where we're going to dismantle the current events for your entertainment through most rational conversations that make it go, oh, really? I'm still your host, Andy Cowan, with my usual suspects. I've got Fred Sims still, uh, Daniel Atchin, and Stephen Griffith. Welcome back, gentlemen, and thank you for staying with me so long. I mean, we've got, got a nice long story here. Okay, so uh, we've had some heavy stuff through the show so far let's see if we can have some have some good things um there is a video attached to uh attached to this first story so i recommend that you go take a look at it because i will not possibly be able to do it justice here on this podcast uh the scottish opera had a very special premiere over the last weekend and is the first dementia friendly opera performance in the united kingdom uh, and it had such a excellent reception, they're already playing their next one. Uh, essentially, what they did was they had a narrator that helped the audience through. They also left the lights, the house lights up, and they did not uh, prevent anyone from talking to each other. In fact, it was encouraged. So, very difficult for actors on stage. It's, it's a very different kind of atmosphere, more like dinner theater where people are clattering, you know, things around. But for people that can't necessarily focus on even who they are or who the person next to them is, this would be a very special kind of performance where somebody is there to tell you what's going on on stage. And that may engage you more in the action. And then if you're still not understanding, you, you are free to communicate with someone next to you in an open and friendly environment. So th- it's really it's really nice to see something like this happen in the world where we can outreach and and bring the arts to a more accessible level for people that are really really suffering. And I'm not sure in in the face of dementia, I'm not sure who's suffering more, the person with the dementia or the caretaker. <laughs> They're both suffering, it's just degrees. Yeah. And when you think about the very currently underutilized technique for people suffering dementia, which is music seems to have a tie that snaps them out of the cage they're trapped in in their minds. There Mm -hmm. are studies. I watched a documentary in one of the classes I take for school. Um, I wish I could remember the name of it. I'll have to go back through my notes and find it. But there are studies in which a a guy went around to various nursing homes um, and and places of the like with uh, personal iPods. And essentially, he, through working up little personality profiles with whatever family he could contact, with whatever the home had, uh, and with whatever conversation he could get out of the patient, um, he would add their music to these iPods and then give them to them so that they could listen to these songs and these tunes and and these melodies that would take them back to a time where their, their brain wasn't in the shape that it is now. And the way that some of these people, even with dementia would, would kind of light up and just start remembering and recall the things that have eluded them for you know, years possibly at this point and, and to be able to give them that in a public setting, not locked away in a nursing home or, you know, even worse, you know, where no one comes to see them and they, they have no one like that's really the big thing here is that, you know, nobody would think that this is a treatment. It, it's like, Oh, this is really cool because of what you're doing for these people, but this is a treatment. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's kind of amazing. It's remarkable. Again, we've talked before about end of life care, palliative care, the show. Mm-hmm. Um, we we and quality of life has been something that we've constantly talked about in the show. And this is this is both. This, this right here is something that can that I think is easily embraced 
the, the, no one should be against this and can be adopted yeah easily by the arts community um this is where government sponsorship of the arts is a good thing yeah it truly is it, it gives it gives a a way to experiment you know if you're if you're not focused solely on the profit center and you're able to experiment with these kind of outreach things because who knows if this was going to make any money for them it might not make any money anyway but it's something that is really useful for the community Huge. it's a public good yes that kind of thing that is what Governments are really good at doing. They can fund these things that are good for the people, even if they're not profitable. Government shouldn't be a business. No. It really shouldn't be a business. Because then the government is there only to make money off of us. I don't want Walmart figuring out my health care. No. You know? that I don't want that. So, hopefully... I think this would be really popular in big retirement centers, like Florida, for instance. Life's end zone. Yeah. <laughs> Where so many people come to die. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully we'll see, we'll see this expand. I, th I think that would be really a fantastic thing. Uh, now, on to another foreign country. <laughs> Canada, up in Ontario. Oh, yeah. are we back to the universal basic income again? Yes. Speaking of quality of life. Yeah, it does. Go ahead. On Ontario has decided that it needs to dip its toes into universal basic income. Um, they are giving it a shot. They are going to try and implement a three-year study to really get the numbers and be a case that they can share with Canada as a whole. Um, see if this is something that's truly viable, especially considering that in the minds of many within their current government, uh, that their, their current welfare systems are degrading. And... That is something that a lot of people in the current government cannot stand. Mm. And this may be an alternative. So uh, the, the article is out on futurism. And uh, I like what I like about futurism is they have this little in brief section right at the top. So just to read that, Ontario, Canada is preparing its own pilot for basic income program in 2017, according to Hugh Siegler, former senator and special advisor to Ontario. He believes that supplemental income should be set at $1,320 a month, or $1,820, for people with disabilities, for it to be effective. That's not a whole lot, obviously. Supplemental income. But it is supplemental, yeah. Um, we do have programs like that here in the United States. Um, it would be Social Supplement Income, SSI. Um, you may have... You, probably know somebody that has been on it at some point in your life. Um, though they may not say anything about it, of course, because it's, you know, that's their own private business. Um, but you do have to qualify for that. So there would be people that would probably qualify for these programs more, more so than not. Um, is that, did it, did it say that in here? You, you've already read through it. So I, I don't want to um, double up, again. Double up they, on it. they they want to get data uh, and see if the the supplemental income uh, is effective at all. Does it need to be higher? Does it need to be lower? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's a place where they can actually start building policy, um, but they need they need the data. Everybody's talked there. The, people have talked at length. Hell, I've talked at length on this show. Mm -hmm. about universal basic income. But until it's implemented and you are actually getting numbers, uh, until you experiment and record the data, it's all talk and you're not going to be able to do anything. So this is going to be a, a three-year test pilot program. Yeah. Uh, and it's, uh, again, targeted at those that are already in need. 
Okay. Uh, and it's trying to see how to automate the system, how to get this in place. If you're going to actually in- implement it, what's the best way? How much money is needed? Yeah. Um, how much money is going to be needed to raise to implement? These are all the, the nitty gritty questions that no one's tackled. And until you actually do a pilot program, you can't. Well, at least nobody's tackled it in, I, I suppose, large enough numbers to really, you know, I, make a difference. Again, and, and, and here, and even one of my issues with, with, with this one is, well, it is a significant city center. Mm-hmm. It's just one city. Um, yeah. Well. And that's, that, that's, that's great at a municipal level, especially for a municipality that can afford it. But when we're getting projections that more and more of our jobs are going to be automated, that's less people working. Yeah, but it's, it's such a it's such a big undertaking, you know, to try and do an, an all or nothing kind of thing. I'm not saying all or nothing. I'm saying it yeah. needs to. But you have to have public buy-in, stu- though. Let, let's get this case study from a municipality. But yeah. I think the next step is if this is something that that people are going to pursue, we need to take it the next step. It needs to be at a county level, and then oh, down to okay. It's incremental yeah. study. Right, right. Okay, so if, if this, this pilot program actually, there is some fruit from it, universal basic income is something that we want to pursue, we need to take the next step. County. Okay. Let's get, get numbers from that. Let's, I would like a test period longer than three years hmm. at a county level. I would like a test period of six. That's going to get you more data. That's going to get you things where you're going to have to flex and find new solutions because you're handling that many more people. Um, yeah, it, and it's it going to give you better data points. It's going to be a bigger, bigger sample size. Yeah, I mean, it, it very much depends on just you know, again, one of our slogans: follow the money. Uh, you know, where is that money coming from? You know, because yeah. typically, on a city level, there there are some city taxes. You know that they can levy fees and things like that. I'm not, I'm not sure if Ontario is one of them. Um, well, hmm. here just, it's like just where this, it's like where re- where is that money coming from? You know, it, it's it's coming from the taxpayer at some yeah. point, but how is that then being collected and then redistributed? You know, that's that's always well, the the question in my mind. But one of the things that I can capable, uh, I can say as a possibility, um, one of the things that I voted on in this election cycle was at a a, a city level where they had a tax that was used specifically for their schools. It, it was a sales tax on all goods. Mm-hmm. Like one of those half, it, half cent sales tax things? Yeah, yeah. That went to schools. And I'm going, okay, you want to, to test and champion universal basic income. Hi. Levy, levy a small municipal sales tax. You can raise monies for this, especially since they're not being overly ambitious with the amount per individual per month. This this is this is not a, a full supplement. This is you know yeah, in addition to what you're already getting. Well just to be clear, this amount of money is our minimum wage. Yeah. So what they so, consider to be a supplemental income, we consider to be, this is what you live on. The the bare ass minimum. Th- this this is this is to supplement what they're they're already making. This is to supplement what's already going in, and see with this. Okay, how does this affect your quality of life? That's always going to be a big question. That was. The question when we went over this stuff from our, our, our European basis for this. Mm-hmm. Okay, quality of life. All right. How did this affect your free time? Okay. Yeah. How did this affect your work? 
Also, I want to get numbers since this is a three-year study. For those that are working and are getting this, are they more productive because they feel more secure? Are, how is this affecting their health? Are they healthier because they are feeling more secure in their income? Because we know that just stresses in our lives cause us to get sick. Oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. <laughs> are, they, are they healthier? Well, they live um, in Canada, so yes, they're healthier. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah. all that data, I want, I want as many data points pulled from this as possible as well as ideas for implementing it at, at, at their current scale, it would also be interesting to see, okay, well, how you implement this smaller or lar- more importantly, larger scale implementation. And one of the questions that is brought up, automation. Mm-hmm. H- how do you make this easily accessible? How can you do this on industrial scales? Um, these sounds are all like questions a, that need to be asked. But sounds like a big the fact problem. that this is moving forward is a great thing. Yeah, more data points. I can't can't disagree with more data points. And you know, if it works, then woo. Otherwise, we learn from it, and then maybe we can try again. Um, apparently, there there are links within this article to uh, Finland and Utrecht in the Netherlands. Uh, there's one in Kenya that doesn't have a link somewhere in India, and also uh, a place in the Switzerland that have all tried the universal basic income. Apparently, Finland, or, or it was raised. Uh, like Switzerland, they voted against it. It was something that was that yeah. was they were going to do a test run, and then they at the last second voted it out. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it died a hard death, but there is a test run. Uh, I believe they're p- trying it out in parts of Mumbai in India. There's, there's proposals for a test run. Um, and then, uh, Utrecht in the Netherlands is going to be similar to the one in Finland where they're going to, uh, be targeting people at multiple income levels, not just the poor, which is a different thing than what we're seeing here in Ontario. Yeah. Um, to see more on the, okay, if we give you this money, since they have, um, their health care is, is funded through the government, they use single payer. Are you taxing health services as much? That was one of the questions that they wanted to find out. Hmm. If we, we do this and you, you can, because one of the things that they did with the Finland one, that they're going to try with the Netherlands is, Okay, so you are somebody who works multiple jobs. Mm -hmm. We're going to put you in this study. Um, We would like you, as part of this study, to quit one of the part-time jobs. Oh, and then examine quality of life. Examine quality of life. Examine how they're taxing health services and other systems. Mm. And see if the government finds a savings. That would be wonderful if they did. I don't know. And getting those data points, I think, would be beautiful. Because if it points to where I think it will point, which is yes, that you actually, the government saves money and people are having a higher quality of life and are working less mm-hmm. and are producing more, then why aren't we doing this? Well, there's a lot of reasons why. The United States won't do that. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Okay. So, um, back here in the States, before we move along to bad ideas, Florida EPA denies plan to drill for oil near the Everglades. Woohoo! That's the last thing we need. <laughs> yeah, right near Miramar. Oh, geez. Uh, let me mute this That's... tab before it starts playing. There we go. <laughs> okay. Controversial proposal to drill for oil in the Everglades about six miles west of Miramar was rejected Wednesday by Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Closing that advertisement. Okay. <clears throat> Which cited the project's location as a reason for the denial. One of many. Yep. You're, uh, suddenly you got very far away again. Ah. Uh, I don't know. Weird. Silly Skype. 
Silly Skype. Okay, so Cantor Real Estate LLC had submitted the application to drill an exploratory well in five acres of Everglades in western Broward County. The proposal generated intense opposition among environmentalists and city governments. Oh, that's good. Uh, Which passed resolutions against it. I think that's all we need to say. Good. Uh, The thing is that those that were filing can appeal, and they are Currently, saying whether they they should or not. Whether they should uh, or not file an appeal. Yeah. Uh. Yes. Uh. Let's see here. It's the thing. The, the, the applicant uh failed to show enough oil was there to justify the project at that location, which was the primary reason filing was denied. Your audio is breaking up. I'm having oh, to I'm having to pot you up, you know, a lot, and we're getting a lot of noise on the line. So let's uh, let's move along from this one, and we'll go on to bad ideas. And in between, maybe 